Bree Johnston is a board certified geriatrician and palliative care specialist, and she has been in our community serving as a direct provider of health for both inpatient and outpatient um, uh, clients, and she has been a strategic leader and educator for health professionals around palliative care for pa uh, Peace Health St. Joseph Medical Center. So please welcome Bree Johnston. Talking about the options of um, stopping treatments or not starting treatments and palliative sedation as well. Okay, Louder, and I have no conflict of interest financially. Um, so uh, these will be my topics. Next slide, and we'll start with stopping treatments. So why stop treatments? I think it's really important to realize that it is everybody's right to refuse any medical interventions that you want to. Sometimes we forget about that with the runaway train of getting to the emergency department and having things moving forward. So with very few exceptions that have to do with some psychiatric illnesses and vaccinations uh, in public school settings, we all have um, uh, the right to refuse treatments now, why do people refuse treatments? Well, there's as many reasons as there are people who refuse treatments, but increasingly what we're seeing and what I'm seeing, and granted, I have a biased uh, a group of patients, are people who don't want to receive treatments because either they're facing a neurodegenerative illness, such as dementia, or sometimes people feel like they've lived a full life, are in a state of increasing dependency, and so decide that they don't want to proceed with treatments that are going to be life prolonging. Next slide. So I think there are three different ways to think about stopping treatments or not initiating treatments. Uh, first, the context of chronic diseases. Secondly, the context of acute diseases. And thirdly, uh, refusing preventive measures. So let's start. How many of you are familiar with the PULSE form? Most of you. How many of you are not familiar with the PULSE form? OK. So the PULSE form um, is available in Washington state and many other states. This was designed to be a form for people with serious illness. But some people also use it just because they do not want certain treatments. For patients who decide that they do not want acute, life-sustaining treatments, it is important to fill out a pulse form. And if you decide that you do not want life-sustaining treatments, you would um, fill out the do not resuscitate box. And there's a box that says comfort measures only. So even people who don't want life prolonging measures can still get comfort measures. That's all right. Um, I just am showing the front page of the Pulse form, but there's a rear page. And the rear page also has on it antibiotic treatments, which you can accept or refuse, and artificial tube feeding treatments. This form has to be filled out with a physician. And if you do fill it out with a physician, it's important to ensure that it gets to the hospital as well and that your loved ones know about it. Usually, it's put on the refrigerator. If you want to, you can put it in an envelope so you don't have to think about that every time you raid the refrigerator um, for cheese. Uh, next slide. Now, the post is a great tool. Um, but trusting the post is not enough. Um, and I, have, I won't say that I see this all the time, but I have seen commonly people who come to the emergency department with a comfort-only post who get life-sustaining interventions in the emergency department. And some of that is because once you get there, it's just kind of a runaway train. The best practice would be 
that before anybody gets treated, we look at the polls and we check in with people, but that isn't always the case, I'm sorry to say. And that's not just Peace Health. I, I would say that is probably any hospital in Lisa Big who works at the VA and down at UW is nodding yes. So it's really important that if you or a loved one has decided that you want comfort interventions only, that if you activate the EMS service or you take somebody to the emergency department, that you say, we are here for comfort measures. We do not want life-sustaining measures. Okay, next slide. Now, some people decide not to treat chronic illnesses. Um, so, keep going. Now, the the thing is, this gets really tricky because you can say, well, gee, uh, you know, I don't want to live much longer, so we are not going to treat my hypertension. That doesn't necessarily mean you're going to die earlier. It might mean that you have a stroke or a heart attack and spend a longer period of time debilitated. So when you think about not treating chronic illnesses like hypertension, it's important to talk to your physician or provider about what the possible outcomes could be. You don't get to choose the outcomes, unfortunately. Diabetes, um, you know, we in medicine are scored on how well controlled our diabetic patients are. But in fact, if you have a life expectancy of less than 10 years, the chances that type diabetes control is going to be beneficial to you is low. Hmm. So that is something you could certainly discuss with your physician or healthcare provider. Now, people who choose not to have life prolonging treatments, um, again, you might want to talk with your physician if you have diabetes about whether or not this would be an option for you. You may just end up feeling really crummy but it is possible that um, it could shorten your life. Um, COPD and lung diseases, for most of these diseases, there are medications that can help uh, reduce symptoms and prolong life. Again, if you decide you want mainly symptomatic treatments, sometimes just using opioids is an option. And finally, kidney disease. Um, we have many patients who decide either not to go on dialysis or to stop dialysis. If you are on dialysis and you stop dialysis, usually people die within a week or two. If you're in the pre-dialysis stage, that stage can go on for a long period of time. The, the, the focus, however, in this part of the talk is these are really decisions that you should understand with your physician. You always have the option for less aggressive treatment, but you need to have a good idea of what the possible outcomes are. Now, even if you have, um, you or your loved one decide to treat your chronic diseases, you can also elect not to have acute diseases treated. And again, you can say that on the pulse form. So if you have things like pneumonia, a urinary tract infection, a heart attack, a blood clot, cancer, or even a hip fracture, you can tell the treating physicians that you want comfort measures only for those conditions. And um, sometimes this is very difficult for physicians to hear, but you always have the right. You can also decline preventive measures if you choose. Cancer screening, um, people who have immobility in the hospital almost always get blood clot prevention treatment. You can elect not to get that if you choose to. Immunizations are trickier because there's a societal benefit. Aortic aneurysm screening is um, another thing uh, that uh, is a screening measure that if you just, so an aortic aneurysm 
we all have, you know, the aorta is the big artery in our body. Many of <coughs> us uh, have enlargement of that and it can rupture over time. My mother, um, who had COPD and dementia, her doctor kept doing screening on her with ultrasounds for her abdominal aneurysm. And she asked me, why are they doing this? And I said, well, it could rupture. And she said, well, what would that be like? I'd say, mm -hmm. well, you know, it's a few hours of pain, and then you would probably die. And she said, that sounds great to me. <laughs> <laughs> Screening. But her physician never had the discussion with her because, you know, it was on the checklist. Um, I want to share not only a story about my mother, but also about my mother-in-law. My mother-in-law uh, died a few years ago. She lived in Sacramento, California. She had uh, muscular dystrophy and dementia. And she was very clear with all of us that she did not want life prolonging treatment. She had really reached that point in her life. She had lived a good life and she was ready. And, um, but she kept being taken, she lived in assisted living and they kept taking her to the emergency department because she kept getting dehydrated and getting urinary tract infections. And my sister-in-law was the power of attorney for health care. And I said, Laura, you know, why do we keep taking Iona to the emergency department? She doesn't want life-prolonging measures. And Laura said, I didn't know you could do that. <laughs> and Laura works in the healthcare field. Sorry. Um, <laughs> <laughs> IT, you know, she does the computers. <laughs> um, but still. Anyway, and so once she found that out, we put her on hospice and she died within a couple of weeks. But it was astounding to me. It never occurred to me that Laura, you know, someone in my family just wouldn't know that that was an option. Okay. And of course, if you decide that at some point you do not want these treatments, you, it's best to write it down, your family member needs to know about it. Your family member needs to be given permission. Your family member or loved one needs to be told, it's okay, this is a loving thing you're doing for me. And if you think you're going to be refusing some treatments that might seem controversial, it is best to have it on paper and it is best to have the full form. Now let's move to palliative sedation. And we'll talk about some definitions and rationale, uh, some ethical challenges, and um, then I'll share a case with you and let you weigh in. Um, so uh, this is uh, just a background statement from the American Academy of Hospice and Palliative Medicine about palliative sedation. Distressing symptoms exist on a spectrum from the most easily treated to the most refractory. Although preservation of awareness at the end of life is viewed as a priority for many, for some, the relief of symptoms may outweigh the desire to be conscious. Palliative sedation, PS, they always need initials, as defined in this statement is the intentional lowering of awareness towards and including <coughs> unconsciousness for patients with severe <coughs> refractory symptoms. Next slide. And in general, there are three levels of sedation that we talk about in medicine. So the first level is ordinary sedation. This really isn't palliative sedation. This is sort of the routine, you know, if you take a sleeping pill or a benzodiazepine or something. So it's sort of sedation and routine medical care. Proportional palliative sedation is sedating medications like benzodiazepines, which are Valium, Ativan, those types of medicines, are increased proportionately as necessary to a level to relieve symptoms. So with this level of sedation, you're really trying to figure out how, how sedated does the person need to be to be comfortable. 
And the final level is palliative sedation to unconsciousness. This is the most controversial level. And this is, unconsciousness is the intended goal of the sedation. Okay, so this is only used for the most extreme cases. So is it legal and is it ethical? Um, and the Supreme Court said, sure, it's legal in 1997. They haven't changed that yet. And the principle of double effect is well established ethically. So, but the principle of double effect is, is if you're trying to achieve a good goal, like relief of symptoms, it is ethically permissible to um, have a secondary effect that maybe is undesirable, such as uh, loss of consciousness. <coughs> Multiple medical organizations have supported palliative sedation as a last resort only, and in patients only who are terminal. Critics worry about slippery slope arguments, and critics of this have said, you know, if you do this for terminal patients, pretty soon you're going to be doing it for people, um, you know, who have five years to live or ten years to live, and pretty soon we'll be euthanizing healthy people. Now, this is not euthanasia, but this is what, you know, critics have conflated this at times. And again, palliative sedation to unconsciousness is the most controversial level. And I think almost everybody who's looked at this issue has said, although this is an acceptable medical intervention, it's really important to have good guidelines and procedures around it so that it is used appropriately. Um, and I think we'd all agree, this is an intervention uh, used for extreme situations. You really want to try other uh, interventions first. Um, and the use of palliative sedation should only be considered after all available expertise to manage the target symptom has been accessed. So for example, we had a woman in the hospital uh, a couple years ago who we were thinking about terminal, I mean palliative sedation on because we just couldn't control her symptoms. She had advanced cancer but had just horrible pain and nausea and vomiting. But finally, we found that an infusion, infusion of ketamine, um, which is uh, an anesthetic medication, controlled her symptoms. So, you know, we kind of pulled everybody together, looked at all the options before we went to palliative sedation. We were able to find uh, an answer before palliative sedation. The level of sedation should be proportionate to the patient's level of distress. And as with all treatments, patients, when able, should participate in the decision of whether or not to use palliative sedation. In clinical practice, palliative sedation usually does not alter the timing or mechanism of a patient's death, as refractory symptoms are most often associated with very advanced terminal illness. And I do want you to know that locally, we have done this for patients, and we do have a policy for it. And I think uh, the current uh, state of things ethically, pay, uh, practitioners who use palliative sedation should be using it to relieve symptoms, uh, not to hasten death. Because patients receiving palliative sedation are typically close to death, most patients will no longer have desire to eat or drink. Artificial nutrition and hydration are not generally expected to benefit the patient receiving palliative sedation. And uh, it's suggested that questions about nutrition and hydration be addressed beforehand. Because we found sometimes when we've initiated palliative sedation that family members uh, get concerned about that. So uh, it's something that has to be discussed openly. Now, um, in the current ethical standard practice, palliative sedation is really just used at that tail end. Next slide. So ethical challenges. 
Existential suffering. So people whose suffering is not physical, but is psychological and existential, is this an appropriate intervention there? And, and that's something that there's been a lot of debate about. Patients who have a significant life expectancy, who, uh, who request palliative sedation, and we're confronting this more and more. Um, we're finding more and more patients and families are asking for this. And institutional and regulatory challenges. Particularly at nursing homes, anytime you use a psychoactive medicine, an antipsychotic medicine, a sedating medicine, it has to be very well documented that you've tried other um, avenues first and that it truly is a last resort. So, and this is just the American Academy of Hospice and Palliative Medicine's statement about existential distress. I think they state well that existential distress may cause patients to experience suffering of significant magnitude, but there is no consensus around the ability to define, assess, and gauge existential suffering, to measure the efficacy of treatments for existential distress, and whether it is in the realm of medicine to palliate such suffering when it occurs absent physical symptoms. <laughs> patients with existential suffering should be thoroughly assessed and treated through vigorous multidisciplinary efforts. If palliative sedation is used for truly refractory existential suffering, it should not shorten survival. So this is kind of ethically where, where we are uh, in terms of most of the professional societies at this point. I'm going to share a case with you. Um, this was a case that, that um, this is kind of a composite of three cases, and then I'm going to let you weigh in on this. Mr. G is a 75-year-old man with moderately advanced dementia. His wife has brought him into the hospital because she could no longer take care of him, and his dementia care unit was no longer able to care for him. He had assaulted various members of the staff, and three staff members were out on medical leave. Attempts at behavioral approaches would manage his behavior most of the time, but he would unpredictably lash out and assault caregivers. Multiple medication regimens fail to control his symptoms. His wife is asking for palliative sedation for her husband, as she states he would be horrified to see himself this way, as he had always been a kind and gentle man. He has an advance directive that states he would want no life prolonging measures if he were unable to recognize relatives, which he cannot. Is palliative sedation appropriate for Mr. G? If so, at what level? So how many of you think palliative sedation to unconsciousness would be appropriate? How many of you think a lighter level of sedation um, to control symptoms. So it seems like that's the majority. And how many of you think it wouldn't be appropriate at all? A few. Interesting. So we have the full gamut here. Um, I am going to ask for just a couple of reactions from the audience on this case. And I'm going to start with Lisa Big, who uh, you'll be I told you I was going to okay. put you on the spot. <laughs> You'll be hearing from Lisa later. Uh, Lisa is uh, head of the ethics committee? Right yeah. Yeah. Um, at uh, the VA Puget Sound. Would you put the case slide back on? Sure. I will. Should we have some audience first? And then we'll... no, okay. Would you, okay. Would you reiterate what the patient yeah. said? Um, he wanted done if he couldn't recognize his people. So he said he, he said he wanted no life prolonging measures, but he never said anything about palliative sedation. Okay. His wife, however, said he would be horrified and he would not want to live this way. He wouldn't want to put anybody else in danger. So any reactions before we go to Dr. Vig? Back. I can see your hand. But... <coughs> yes, sir. I'm going to have to stand there. there. And we would have patients like that. We have patients like that on the floor. And it was so difficult. I mean, you were in danger yourself, and the your other patients were in danger. And I think I would certainly be in favor of a lighter sedation so that you didn't have somebody wandering the hall because there's nothing you can do to help you. 
So for those of you who might not have been able to hear, she said that she has been a nurse and she has experienced patients like this and she would support some kind of sedation yeah. to manage the symptoms. Use, in the days of Europe, we use posies okay. and wrist restraints and you can't use it. Okay. And, and no, I, we can't do that. Yeah. <laughs> Here's someone in the middle. Oh, yes. Hopefully I can speak loudly enough. So the one question that I have is, how, how well does the staff know the wife? And how, how much do we trust what another person says for another person? Well, how much do we trust what one person says for another person? Great question. That's a very good question. Um, just to follow up, do we assume that the wife has medical power of attorney in this case? Yeah, so, so that's a, a good question, and she does have medical power of attorney, but even if he didn't have a power of attorney document, she legally uh, would be the surrogate decision maker. Now, whether or not he would have expressed uh, specific wishes is another issue. In the back row. Um, I believe that this man deserves life with dignity and a peaceful passage to the next life which he apparently has asked for and she is supporting. I would like to think of wanting no life prolonging measures. He's unable to re recognize his relatives, which means he may not be able to feed himself. If he were being fed, that would be a life prolonging measure. And thus, he would fit the uh, criteria for heavier palliative sedation Less palliative sedation simply puts him at risk for falling and greater injury. Well, it just also seems to point out the importance of a really detailed advanced directive and mentioning the possibility of voluntary stopping eating and drinking if you got to that stage in your life. And even if you did put it in your health directive, guaranteed, it is not always guaranteed that your loved one can make that happen. But at that point, I, I, would it have been possible for the doctor to have sedated him at home or some or someplace enough so that they could go through not eating and drinking? Is that possible? Um, you know, I think that's uh, something that should always be considered. Yes. Yes. So it's advanced directives. Yeah. Yeah. So important. In the middle. I guess my question is, what is appropriate? What does it mean? <laughs> because, you know, you talked about the existential suffering. And it would seem like from a legal perspective, this doesn't fit the right. This is, this is existential suffering. So if you're talking about an institution dealing with that episode, the legality of the override would have very And even, and, and you know, there are legal and regulatory issues. But there's also the issues of, of the staff dealing with it. And quite often, um, there are staff members with varying opinions about things. And let's, let's have Lisa weigh in. OK, so as you guys can see, this is really tricky. right? There aren't really good answers. And these are the things that people struggle with, and I think as the baby boomer generation gets older and starts running into dementia, this is going to happen more and more and more. And in our society, we don't really have a good answer. Because as you can see, some people think, oh, it's fine. Let's just knock them out. Other people say, yeah, something about that just feels not quite right. And so I don't think there's a slam dunk here. I think we need more information. We need to find out more about his life and what he cared about and what he valued. We need to talk to the folks at the facility where he's been living and find out if there's certain things that sets him off. Um, and maybe not. Maybe he's just one of these guys who, for no apparent reason, lashes out from time to time. And yet, in, in many of the cases, you can figure out something, whether it's a caregiver a certain caregiver, whether it's a time of day, whether it's a person who approaches him a certain way that sort of startles him and then he's scared. So I don't have a good answer on this one. It's, and, it's and, and the reason, uh, I put this up to be provocative, obviously. Um, <laughs> but I, I also put it up because I do think we're going to be facing this more. So I, there are a couple of take-home points. One of the things that really concerns me about this kind of case 
is that quite often what we hear is, yes, we've tried everything behaviorally, and you find out that everything hasn't been tried behaviorally. So many times, comfort measures, music, touch, massage, um, you know, walks outside, as opposed to being in a sterile institutional setting, can make a huge difference. So I am always very skeptical when I hear, we've tried everything. The other thing is, I think when we start to think about sedation for people who have a, a, a longer life expectancy, we really have to be careful. And we really have to make certain that we're doing things right. And I think this speaks to Phyllis's comment that more detailed advanced directives are very important. Um, and that we really do want ethical safeguards so we are certain that our vulnerable elders aren't abused in some way. You know, we want to respect everybody's wishes, but, you know, we certainly don't want a situation where we aren't giving uh, people uh, their fair shake if this, if maybe they didn't want uh, palliative sedation. So, next slide. So this is something for you all to think about, and I think over the next 10 years we're going to be seeing more discussions about these kind of cases. Again, I just have this slide because um, it, Mr. G was probably very, uh, you know, earlier on that trajectory. So in the way we currently talk about palliative sedation, certainly to unconsciousness, he would not be a candidate that we would normally think about but it's still an issue we need to uh, address. So, so to summarize, patients have the right to decline treatments. The POLST is a useful tool. Advanced directives are very important. Palived sedation is one tool that can be used um, in cases of refractory suffering. And ethically challenging areas include palliative sedation for existential distress, and palliative sedation for people with a longer life expectancy. So I think I've used up my whole time. Can we have maybe one question? Yes, we can take one question. As regards uh, advanced directives, first of all, I don't understand the distinction between the POLST and an advanced directive and what is the usage there. Secondly, um, you're talking about getting details into an advanced directive. I can't imagine trying to get all of the permutations of uh, possibility in there. The question is, how do you get a philosophical direction kind of established rather than try to list all the details? Yeah, I, I think those are fabulous, uh, two fabulous questions. So the first, what's the difference between a POLST and an advanced directive? A POLST is a physician's order. So it really depicts what you want right now. So um, the pulse changes as you change. An advanced directive, in distinction to a pulse, talks about what you would want under certain conditions. Now, in the medical field, and, and I think ethically, we've all sort of moved away from advanced directives that talk about specific interventions, and we talk more about what our goals are. What are the states to you that living in that state would be worse than death? And, and so if you really put in your advance directive those types of things, like you know, <coughs> if I have to be dependent, live in a nursing home, don't recognize my family, I don't want life-sustaining measures, you don't have to get into what all the life-sustaining measures are. If you think you're a, you are a person, who might want VSAT, or who might want something a little bit more extreme, that needs to be spelled out, because ethically that's going to be the best, best way to guarantee it, and you won't even necessarily guarantee um, that your wishes will be fulfilled, because many times there are institutional factors at play as well. So thank you, Bree. I'll be out of here. <laughs>